we go. Live from the UK's capital. Reaching out into other worlds. Alton Andrews. London tonight. We are controlling transmission. We arranged this meeting um, to celebrate what has become known as Climate Fools Day, which is the which is the anniversary, or in fact, it's tomorrow is the anniversary of the um, of the passing of the Climate Bill um, by Parliament, which commits us to some incredible um, reductions in CO2 levels by 2030, I believe. Um, and we are. We are here to try and, I suppose, our, our, our real aim is to repeal it, to get it repealed. And I suppose that's what we're basically about. As you're obviously all aware, we are all against uh, what has become known as the, um, you know, the CO2 scam, or whatever you wish to call it. Um, we, we think there is no truth in it whatsoever. We consider that the, the greatest threat to the future prosperity of the world is indeed you know, an adherence to this um, theory that CO2 caused by man causes global warming, caused catastrophic climate change. Um, and the, the aim of this meeting is to, and subsequent meetings we hope to have, is to try and reverse that bill, basically, and, and all the nonsense that goes with it. And we are scientists putting evidence first. And... Uh, uh, I think it's very important to understand that, that so far the media have been ignoring real science, instead they put forward, um, well actually, failed science. We believe in evidence-based science. And the message of support is from Brisbane, where we have a simultaneous demonstration, well actually a bit earlier today, um, in support of Climate Fools Day worldwide to mark the day when the British Parliament voted against nature. Um, this is a peaceful discussion in Brisbane King George Square today earlier and they asked me to send uh, solidarity greetings to you. So on that note, thank you and we'll get on with the rest of the meeting and I'll be speaking later. Thank you. Last December the name of Copenhagen was on everyone's lips. When statesmen from 120 countries gathered there to agree to measures to save the planet from climate change. They were unable to reach an agreement. The, this failure to reach an agreement, coupled with the various scandals associated with the IPCC and the University of East Anglia, has led to a change of emphasis from the reduction of CO2 emissions to the need for energy security and provisions of new green jobs. Once again, Denmark appears here to be a key player. Even in April 2009, President Obama said in his Earth Day speech following, it's estimated that if we fully pursue our potential for wind energy on land and offshore, wind can generate as much as 20% of our electricity by 2030 and create a quarter million jobs in the process. Jobs that pay well and provide good benefits. It's a win-win situation. It's good for the environment. It's great for the economy. Today, America produces less than 3% of our electricity through renewable resources like wind and solar less than 3%. Now, in comparison, Denmark produces almost 20% of the electricity through wind power. When Denmark can, we can. Yes, we can. Wind turbines, good for the environment and great for the economy. This sentiment was taken up by your government, the present and the former. The reality, however, is quite different. First of all, wind only produces 9% of the electricity in Denmark, and about half of that electricity is exported to Norway, Sweden, and Germany, as the supply often exceeds, exceeds the demand, and Denmark has no means of electrical storage. These exports are supplied virtually free of charge 
to the neighboring countries. It's true that wind energy has saved CO2 emissions, for about 2.4 million ton every year in Denmark. But the subsidy to achieve that was 12.3 billion Danish kroner, in pounds 1.3 billion, or an average cost of 647 Danish kroner per ton CO2. And that is a fantastic expensive way of reducing CO2. The yearly state subsidy, state subsidy to the wind energy industry is about 2 billion Danish kroner every year. In a British context, if you are to follow the Danish experience, your subsidy will be about 2 billion pounds every year. You can then ask, can this country afford that? The subsidy per job created in Denmark is, in the wind industry, is a hundred thousand pounds. That's quite a lot of money to create a job. A couple of things to say. Yes, we are sending a challenge to Prince Charles, and Václav Klaus is going to sign that challenge. Basically, it's the Copenhagen Climate Challenge we sent to the UN with 10 points. You'll find that again in your pack, along with 166 scientists who signed up for the Copenhagen um, Climate Challenge. So that's happening. As I've been introduced, I'm Philip Foster. I'm a retired clergyman, but my background was in science. Um, I did natural sciences at Cambridge. And I'm going to begin my uh, speech by saying, fellow dinosaurs, cableists, flat earthers, and honorable members, <laughs> um, we have been obviously labeled. It's a nice thing to be. Uh, as we shall see, some of these labels do rather backfire. The dinosaurs lasted rather a long time, I seem to remember, and we may not see these guys yet. And as Graham has already said, one of our aims of this meeting and hopefully subsequent meetings here in Parliament from time to time is to push and encourage MPs to repeal the climate bill, uh, which is going to cost us, as Christopher Booker will explain, such an awful amount. But I'm going to spin through what I call the long view of climate. Most of you will know this. If you're climate skeptics, you will know this. If you're at least interested, I hope you will briefly pay attention. One thing I want to say is that belief and trust are for God. Skepticism is for science. I think that's an important thing to say. And my fellow panelists may or may not ag agree with me on the issue of God, but certainly we are all agreed on the issue of skepticism is science. Any scientist who is not in a sense by nature skeptical is not acting as a proper scientist. That's the way it works. <laughs> 